Thank you so much, Jen. And of course, an incredible history from journalist and historian Gary Camillo talking about what was. And now we're going to speak to someone who is very much in the middle of what is now and what will come in the future. And I really believe that when the history of this pandemic is written, a lot of source information will be from the reports done by our next guest. Please welcome Heather Knight from the San Francisco Chronicle. Heather, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. So first of all, I uh, want to ask you what we try to ask a lot of our guests, how have you been dealing with the great pause? I understand you have two little ones at home and they both had COVID-19 great pause birthdays this month. <laughs> yeah, there's no great pause happening here. I'm busier than ever. Um, working full time from home, my husband's working full time from home and our two little kids are attempting to virtual learn from home as well. So there's a lot going on under our roof. If they happen to come into the screen, that is why I told them not to, but <laughs> we will see. That's all right. That's all right. You know, my husband Alfredo always says whenever we travel and he sees parents traveling with children, he says every town in every country on planet Earth should have a statue to parents, especially ones who travel with kids. And now I think it goes for parents who are homeschooling with children. So thank you for doing that. I know it's a challenge. So you are already incredibly well known in San Francisco for your coverage. And, you know, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I have noticed over the last two months as someone in communications, a more personal relationship in the way reporters are reporting. It seems like that fourth wall that we always try to maintain between our professional selves and our personal selves has been somewhat blurred. Uh, I've noticed your writing has become more personal and more passionate, especially when you're covering the homeless issue. What have you learned during this COVID-19 coverage that you've been doing? Um, yeah, I always try to be a little more personal as a columnist than I would as a regular uh, news reporter. I've really been trying during this pandemic to really mix the hard hitting horrible news that of course is all around us with more uplifting, you know, some happy things too. Personally, I've been really enjoying the closed streets like Twin Peaks Boulevard and Great Highway. Those have been kind of blessings and silver linings and all of this. But um, of course, most of it is horrible. Um, we are seeing, especially the Tenderloin, I was just there yesterday walking around with Supervisor Matt Haney, and it's never, you know, super fun to walk around the Tenderloin, but um, I think so many of us are at home in other neighborhoods that we aren't downtown nearly as much as we normally would be, and to actually see it up close for several hours yesterday was pretty horrifying. I'm working on a column about that now. Um, there are more tents than ever. The most recent count is close to 450 tents just in the Tenderloin. Um, I saw bodies just, you know, just sprawled on the sidewalks, unclear if they were what was going on, sleeping, um, passed out, they were unconscious, more needles than I'd seen in a long time. There aren't enough hand washing stations or bathrooms, um, see the usual human feces on the sidewalks, and it was just, you know, pretty grim. Um, City Hall says they have a plan and they're working on it, but walking around there doesn't feel like whatever this plan is really coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. Heather, how long have you lived in San Francisco and how long have you been writing for the Chronicle or even by, how long have you been a journalist? Um, same amount of time. I moved to the city when I was 22 and for the Chronicle job, it was an internship back then, a two-year internship back when the first dot-com boom was going and they had um, a lot of internships because places like Webvan and Pets.com were advertising in the Chronicle, so we had a lot of money. And um, that was 1999, and I've been at the Chronicle ever since and living in the city ever since. Heather, your coverage of the homeless issue, I mean, COVID-19 in general, but specifically the homeless issue, has been incredibly moving and I believe has had an impact on the people who make policy. What are you hearing from the policymakers, whether it's the mayor's office or the legislators or the people who carry out policy, Department of Public Works, the police, the fire department? What are you hearing about how they feel we're gonna come out of COVID vis-a-vis -vis the homeless? It's really unclear. That's another really shocking part of all of this is that they're struggling so much. I think you know the vast majority of people who work for the city have their hearts in the right place. They do care about homeless people. They want things to be better, but everybody's just so puzzled about how to actually make that happen. Is the right answer hotel rooms, safe sleeping sites? Clearly it's not what's happening in the Tenderloin, which is just leaving them packed on sidewalks so nobody can social distance and 
um, families and seniors and kids are stuck inside their little SRO hotels, unable to go out even for exercise because they can't safely do that. So um, I think officials are still so in the thick of figuring out what the right plan of action is now that I'm not hearing a lot about the recovery because the problem is still so major. We don't seem to be anywhere near where that recovery would come into play. Um, one example of that is they put new safe camping sites up. Um, one is near the Asian Art Museum on Fulton. One is, I just saw yesterday, um, being put up at 180 Jones, and another is planned for that old McDonald's site in the Haight. Um, they're still getting those up and running, and I haven't heard anything about what happens to the people camping there after this pandemic is over. Um, I've heard no plan about what will happen to them, and I've heard no plan about what will happen to all of the people who've been moved into hotels. Supervisor, Supervisor Haney worked as a um, volunteer at one of the Soma homeless hotels last week and said, it's really working. Um, people are just, you know, holding up inside. They finally have beds, they have TVs, they have their own bathrooms, and they're, for the most part, relieved to be out of, you know, out of the Tenderloin and inside somewhere safe. And he has yet to hear what the plan is after, because these hotels are going to want their rooms back once tourists are coming back to San Francisco. So. It doesn't seem fair to just move everybody back onto the sidewalks. Um, that would create a whole new batch of health problems. So I, I'm definitely interested to see what happens. Well, you know, Heather, there's there's been so much written about the the almost intractable problem of the homeless. I'd like to call it the problem. I've always said when people call it the homeless problem, it's mainly a problem for people without homes. But it's an issue that impacts every part of the population. It's a health edu issue. It's uh, an issue of mental health. It's an issue of physical health. Have we had a spike in COVID-19 cases in the homeless community worse or better than we expected? How are we just vis-a-vis -vis the health impact of this on the homeless? Mm -hmm. Well, we all know there was that big outbreak at MSC uh, shelter and there have been some outbreaks in SRO hotels. Um, but the pro we don't really know what's going on in the street because people aren't being tested enough. So it's hard to imagine there isn't a virus circulating, you know, somewhere on the sidewalks. But to my knowledge, most people haven't been tested. So we don't know that for sure. Um, and But we did have a really compelling story in the Chronicle a couple of days ago about the um, real spike in homeless deaths during shelter in place that had nothing to do with the virus specifically anyway. Uh, I can't remember the statistics off the top of my head, but far more people died in May, April, in uh, March, April, and May this year who were living on the streets than same time last year. Um, more overdoses, other you know health issues coming up, and that seems to be because there are um, so many fewer services for them right now. Shelters have um, capped their capacity. You can't get a shelter bed in San Francisco right now because they're just all full to newcomers to keep social distancing, and so there's really nothing unless you're very um, a senior or uh, your health is compromised, you're very unlikely to get a hotel room. So there just aren't very many options. Clinics are closed or shut to new people. Treatment facilities, same. You know, these places can't take as many people as they used to because of social distancing. So there are just far fewer options and other health issues that aren't necessarily caused by the virus are being worsened because of the virus. You know, I, I moved to San Francisco in 1986 during the height, or I rather should say the depths of the AIDS HIV pandemic. And I remember uh, being cautious, but finding a way to get through this, but always looking down. I didn't want to step on a hypodermic needle. And of course, now when you walk through the Tenderloin or some neighborhoods, even the Castro, I always think, well, am I going to step in poop or on a needle? And then I'd much rather step in poop. But we're <laughs> dealing with streets that are filthy and are a health risk. Do you ever feel when you're covering this uh, at risk yourself? You've got a husband, you have two kids at home. I mean, you know, how do you deal with walking into a situation which is unhealthy for journalists and the people living on the streets? Yeah, I, I didn't feel great being in the Tenderloin all afternoon yesterday. I definitely took a shower as soon as I got home, but um, I really want to hand it to the Chronicle photographers who have to be out every day um, at reporters can do a lot of our work over the phone and over the computer and from home and that's how I'm mostly doing reporting but it's still important to get out and see what's going on for yourself when you can and the photographers are doing that all the time they have a whole um, process for you know being safe masks gloves um, hand sanitizer decontaminating all of the equipment 
your car, everything, a specific procedure for when they get home. And it, it is a lot to think about in a, in a job that's already busy and stressful to add all of that on top of it. But we have to be safe for ourselves and for everybody that we're interviewing and taking pictures of, you know, to not spread the virus. Heather, we've only got a couple minutes left, but I want to ask you about how you get the stories you get. I mean, politicians are generally not shy about wanting to talk to a reporter. Um, no. And there are... <laughs> I guess it depends on the story. I guess it depends on the story. But I, I'm more interested in how you get the stories from the people that are actually living on the street, the people who are part of the homeless community. Many of them I know from, we worked with the Mental Health Association of California a number of years ago. And I know that I don't have the, the stats right at hand, but a huge percentage of people who are homeless are also impacted by psychological issues and other health issues and schizophrenia. They don't take their meds. How do you approach and get the trust of someone in the homeless community to get them to share their story with you? And how do you then verify that what they're saying is true? What's newsworthy? Mm -hmm. What is newsworthy on the streets? Mm -hmm. In terms of the mental illness and homelessness, I have found um, Supervisor Raphael Mandelman to be a great source. And one of my favorite columns that I've done so far this year was walking around the Castro with him trying to talk to some of these most disturbed uh, mentally ill homeless people and um, just to write about that experience to try to help them and what happens and how do you get help and how does the average person when they see someone in clear distress and know that they can't just keep walking like how do you actually try to get help it's really hard and a lot more complicated than it should be and so i wrote a column about that and um what really moved readers was that and after being out in the castro with the supervisor for a few hours uh, he broke down in tears. He paused our interview and stepped away because it was just so hard to see the Castro, which is this, you know, beacon of of LGBT rights and such a historical neighborhood just being ruined because of city inaction. And um, it was a really compelling column because I could just paint this picture of this supervisor trying to help and just the desperation of so many people on the streets all wrapped into one. And it was that kind of thing, just being out, seeing what's happening, talking to real people is the best way to be a journalist. Yes, I, I remember that column and I know I was not alone in being very moved by it. And of course, I'm not talking out of school. Supervisor Mandelman has been very out of the closet about being someone who was directly impacted by mental illness, dealing with his mother. Mm -hmm. And his sharing his personal story it helped I think give him a lot of credibility in this issue about how to deal with the city's homeless. That brings me to one of my last questions. Mayor Breed and others, Senator Weiner, have been very, very uh, proactive in talking about how we need to have more aggressive conservatorship. Do you think now when we're in the middle of clearly a health crisis, there was already a health crisis before COVID-19 of people living on the streets, do you think that we will see a renewed call for more direct conservatorship? And do you think that right now there is the political capital to make that happen? Um, it was about to happen. Um, the city opted into State Senator Scott Weiner's um, law to strengthen conservatorship programs. But um, under that program, not a single person has been conserved so far in San Francisco. Um, all attention, money, and um, time has been diverted to COVID-19. So I'm afraid that we're actually moving away from concentrating on the homeless crisis and the mental health crisis, even though it is exacerbated and worsened by the virus. I'm afraid that it's not getting as much attention because um, the pandemic is at the top of everybody's minds. Right. Heather, Journalists are usually supposed to be, of course, you know, completely unopinionated, but we all know that we're, we're human. And this show is a case in point. We've offered it to offer insight and hopefully resources as we go from the great pause into the great return. What advice do you have for your readers or people watching this show as we, you know, the, the narrative has changed, as they say, in public relations. Now we're all talking about how we get on and COVID has become this kind of back noise that has resulted in over 100,000 deaths in the United States in less than three months. What advice mm -hmm. do you have as a journalist and then also as a San Franciscan about how we move forward out of this? I think everybody who can should donate to nonprofits that are working on the recovery. Um, I think one important thing is to remember that so many people that we used to interact with all the time are out of work. Um, 
pay your housekeeper if you can, even if you're not having her clean. Pay your hairdresser, even though you can't go get your hair done, and I'd really like to do that right now. Um, <laughs> pay, pay people that aren't getting paid because, you know, if we're working, we're still getting our salaries and they should be getting some help too. Subscribe to your local paper, vote, um, watch shows like this, just be informed and educated. Great. Well, thank you, Heather. I've been a San Francisco Chronicle subscriber since 1986, and I don't see that changing. Any closing <laughs> thoughts? And I guess I, I, I am going to squeeze in one more question. Are you hopeful and optimistic? I try to be. Um, I'll, I'll say yes, because that's a better note to end on. Uh, but I think San Franciscans are a very creative and compassionate bunch. And so I've been um, proud of how we've coped uh, in most cases with the virus so far. We've kept people healthy compared to other cities. Um, and I think that we have the creativity and intelligence, belief in data and science to, um, to keep weathering this. Great, thank you so much. We've been speaking with Heather Knight at the San Francisco Chronicle, and we both look forward to a haircut very, very soon. Best to your husband and your children. Thank you, Heather. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Jen, back to you.